Okay, okay great. So hello everyone. Uh, this talk will be about uh, fuse mount recovery. Uh, this topic was raised uh, was raised uh, by me on the previous Linux Plumbers conference, and it was more about uh, Creo side. <clears throat> and idea was to investigate if it's possible to implement this feature in Creo project to be able to checkpoint restore containers with the few daemon inside. Uh, then I started to work on the Lexi project and uh, found a pretty, pretty close issue uh, with the Lexi FS file system, uh, which we use in the Lexi project to virtualize some ProcFS and CISO, some specific ProcFS and CISFS files like load average, CPU info, etc. And the idea was that Lexi FS fuse daemon is the single point, single point of failure. Uh, usually on the node because the fuse daemon is the shared sync between a bunch of uh, containers. And if some, and if anything goes wrong with the fuse daemon, with the like first fuse daemon, it means that all the virtualized files like load average will be broken from that point. And another motivation is that we have a few bunch of uh, different storage solution like CFFS fuse, ClusterFS and others who use utilize the fuse uh, file system to provide the user space with ability to mount these file systems. And for instance, for CFFS, well, we have the in kernel driver for CFFS. Uh, you can't use this kernel driver inside the container workloads if you want to mount this fuse, uh, this CFFS file system inside the user namespace because it's forbidden. So you can only mount CFFS on the host and then bind mount and somehow to the container. That's the motivation to use CFFS fuse, for instance. Uh, our first approach to this problem uh, was posted on the Linux kernel mailing lists as this uh, small patch series. Effectively, it implements uh, a two IOCTLs uh, that allows to reset the initial, the internal state of the fuse mount inside the Linux kernel and also uh, somehow reinitialize the fuse connection to make new daemon work. And generally, I have received no objections against the idea, but implementation was criticized because of one weak point in this implementation that I will cover a little bit later. And also thanks to the community, Bernd Schubert, Miklos Zredi, Christian Browner for reviews and comments on that. So it was really great. Uh, the pro let's just elaborate the idea. Uh, if we have the fuse mount on the node and we use it at, and something goes wrong in the fuse daemon, it, it, and it eventually crashes. Uh, what it means for us, it means that from this point, the fuse connection will be broken and all mounts that we have associated with this fuse connection and this fuse daemon will be broken and not accessible anymore. Uh, first idea uh, that comes into mind uh, from the first attempt to fix this is to hold the fuse connection file descriptor somewhere in addition to the fuse daemon, for example, in parent process, Unix socket, uh, to keep the struct file reference counter to be more than one all the time. And it uh, makes connection unbreakable in that regard. Uh, and then uh, what we can do with this descriptor when the first fuse daemon process crashes at some point, we can start a new one, then uh, reuse the old con uh, fuse connection file descriptor in the, in the new daemon, and just everything should continue to work smoothly. Uh, this is a naive uh, idea that comes into mind at first. But the problem is that it does not work as expected. Uh, uh, so the idea is to introduce IOCTO that will uh, allow us to initialize things inside the kernel. So we will carefully clean up in kernel state of fuse connection, uh, but we will keep all the mounts and all the rest stuff in place without, without bothering. Uh, for example, what we can clean up, we can clean up the fuse connection flux, like no open, no flock and so on, because this, uh, this uh, fuse flux uh, can be initialized in the runtime. And also we need to drop all non-processed fuse requests 
Uh, those are waiting to be processed by the user space daemon and user space daemon, of course, cannot process them because it's his died. And also we need to send a new fuse init request to a new user space daemon. Uh, so uh, the new user space daemon will just start from scratch as the amount is the first one, but just reusing all the amount points. Uh, and again, uh, do we have any extra problems here? Unfortunately, yes, because if you try to go this way with any uh, solution that based on libfuse and for simplicity, your new daemon will crash at some point. Uh, why? Because uh, it will receive, if, if you start to debugging this issue, you will see that your new fuse daemon uh, gets a fuse request from the kernel, usually it's, uh, it will be fuse open request uh, that refers the inode number, which is not uh, which is not known for the user space daemon. And I'm sorry, can you hear me? Alex, we can't hear you anymore. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, so uh, the problem is that the new user space daemon will continue to receive, few, for example, fuse open requests, uh, which will refer the inode number that will be not known for a new daemon, of course, because this inode number is, is from the old one session. So uh, at this point, we, uh, we will get an assertion from inside the internals of libfuse and everything will be crashed. And another question is the what we can do with the file descriptions that were opened before a new daemon was started. So uh, it means that we need some way to invalidate all the old stuff and replace it with a new one. Uh, and here we comes uh, we can talk about dentary revalidation mechanism. Dentary revalidation mechanism is pretty uh, is used widely by the file systems like Fuse. Uh, uh, what this, uh, we, and we have the dentry de-revalidate callback on the, for the dentry that uh, called after, in, in the first pass of lookup, VFS lookup machinery, if this dentry was uh, to, 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 let the, to let the file system internals to uh, tell the VFS uh, API VFS machinery to know if this dentry is valid or not. And Fuse file system, of course, also implements uh, the, this callback. And idea was to extend the implementation of this algorithm inside Fuse to make it aware of uh, the effectively connection generation thing. So this is a new concept that we're introducing in this, in this patch set that uh, uh, the idea is that when you mount the file system at the first time, connection generation is, let's say, one. But when you call the fuse uh, ioctal reinit sync, the connection generation will be bigger uh, in step one. And all the inodes and files and all the stuff that depends on the connection generate on the connection uh, will keep the same uh, connection generation that it was before. And it means that when we enter to the dentry revalidation function, we will easily understand if this dentry is actual or not. And if it's not, then this dentry will be reported as a stale to the VFS uh, machinery in the kernel. VFS will release this dentry, go to a slow lookup pass, uh, and force a new dentry allocation, and then a new inode allocation, and look up for it. So we will end in this case. We will end up with the new fuse lookup request at first, and then fuse open request. Uh, while before that change, uh, if you try to open pass that what that which was cached before uh, in the dentry cache, uh, only the fuse open uh, request will be sent to the user space, and it will break your user space daemon because uh, the fuse uh, open. Uh, 
request contains the I know number that only known for the user space. And that's that's a problem. And we solve this problem by doing that. Uh, okay. And unfortunately, that's not all. <laughs> because that revalidation solves the problem of new daemon crashing, but uh, the problem is that we have we, we may have and we may use a bind mounts for fuse mount. And this problem was originally discovered by Stefan when we have been playing with that uh, proof of concept. And uh, the problem is that if you have the uh, super block, fuse uh, mount super block, and if you have a bunch of bind mounts of it, non root bind mounts, which means that these bind mounts created not from the mount root, but instead of from the some subdirectory of the mount or some file from the mount, uh, you're in trouble in this case because the when the each VFS mount in kernel uh, refers through the field called mnt root to the entry of this particular mount. And bind mounts are not exclusion of this from this rule, of course. And uh, as the dentry becomes stale and invalid, uh, once you try to touch this bind mount, you will fail. Uh, and what we can do with that? The idea was, and this is the weakest point of the whole idea, is uh, to introduce another one IOCTL called fuse def IOC bind mount revalidation, revalidate, I'm sorry, uh, which takes a list of mounts for the fuse super block, traverses uh, this list of mounts, uh, calculate the, as a string, calculate the dentry pass for each mount root, for each bind mount, then use VFS pass lookup uh, internal kernel API that allows you to look up a dentry for some pass. And then update the mount root with a new dentry. Uh, so in the final of this algorithm, you will get the same dentry from the uh, logical point of view, from the user's perspective, but in fact, it will be another dentry with new generation and everything will go, will work smoothly. But this approach uh, feels too hacky. And Christian, of course, was not happy about that. <laughs> and we uh, decided to uh, stop at this point and try to think more. Maybe you have another ideas. And uh, currently, sorry, currently uh, we get stuck on that because I have seen that uh, since last six months, a new feature was, was introduced into the VFS called move mount beneath, which can be useful in this case, I guess, but I have not played with it a lot uh, yet. And so this is on my plan. And if it works, then we can get rid of this hacky machinery for the bind mount revalidation uh, that is shown here. And uh, we can post a new version of kernel series. The purpose of this talk was to share with you these problems that we come through along the way. And I would like to get any feedback from you if, it's, if this idea is good or not, if it's useful or not. So it's more about discussing things, not uh, sharing that everything was done perfectly and everything works. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in, fu in Fuse at all, but uh, but the situation you're looking at here, as far as the demon crashing and coming back, is if you think about Fuse in a lot, you know, in some ways, right? It's a lot like a network file system, right? It's just that your 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 file, your the server is a process running on your box, right? Um, and, and this is very much analogous to the situation that you have when an NFS server crashes, right? And really what you want to be doing, probably you're looking at doing is some sort of state recovery. Um, I don't know that it's, you know, you'd be able to do that trivially, you know, with, uh, you know, existing fuse demons, but, you know, extending the fuse protocol to allow for the recovery of state might be the approach you want to take here. Uh, I mean, it's probably a, a lot bigger engineering effort than what you're looking at here, but but I don't see a way around doing that because you know even if you fix this problem with uh, you know you, you know you get uh, um, derevalidate working and, and you you know are able to invalidate your dentries, you still have the problem of of open files. Like what are you going to do with all the files that you have open that crashed? You know when the demon crashed, uh, and, and the only way to do that is to really to recover the state 
behind the scenes and hook it up to the existing file descriptors. Yeah, the that's the, uh, what you put your own files. Um, the the reason why we didn't care uh, is because for us the main where we came up with this thing was LexCFS, which is uh, kind of layer on top of Proc. Uh, and for those files, like, well, if we just fail with you know input output error, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, because people, there are tiny files, people will just read them again. Like it's, we just got unlucky, we're at the wrong time, whatever. Um, so that's fine in that case. It's probably, it's a big, like it's a much bigger problem with more like, well, different files, different types of fused file systems where people actually interact with the file over a long, long time as in you do with normal file system. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like they, the, yeah, the mind mind issue obviously came out of, we need to bind mount this thing on top of the, 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 the files in the containers. We can't pass the entire file system, so we're like, oh crap, this is not gonna work actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we're gonna end up having bind mounts to something that doesn't exist anymore. Um, getting more state is kind of interesting. I mean, I the, the thing is that the bind mount recovery, in my opinion, will not work. Hmm. I mean, and if it's going to be made to work, it will be so ugly that we don't want to merge it. Well, I mean, it can work if you have a way to persist the libfuse state. So at that point, when you do get the query for that um, that I know it's allocated back I then, mean, you know what it is, and you can move on. You can. My point is, you can update mount root, for example. Right. Yeah. So that that was definitely the ugly part, and why we're like, that's what uh, Alex was saying. Like, this doesn't seem like it's gonna go anywhere with that option. Uh, the other option, which was like try to get more state during the crash, so that you can better recover the server side. That would be effectively if we can keep track. Um, like if you can recover the, the mapping from the fuse of um, like the assigned numbers to what actually is, then you don't have the problem because the assigned number never change. So you can just reconnect and all of those mind months are still valid. Um, that would be the alternative there. But the problem is like, how do you capture that thing? You don't want to keep writing it, obviously that seems like a bit of a problem. Uh, can you put enough stuff during like a, on a, on a codem handler, for example, to pull that stuff out at that time? Mm -hmm. Um, that's why it gets not tricky. Maybe I don't quite understand the problem you're solving with this bind mount switching. Are, are you, is the problem that the inode is going, or the dentry and inode are going to be different when you remount? And, yeah. Okay, and you lose the yeah. Okay, fair enough. Got it. Yeah, that's that's the only issue. Effectively, we put bind mounts to nowhere, and yeah. <laughs> that's a problem. Um, yeah. But if we can make them point to somewhere that exists by not having, like, by actually knowing what the old inode supposed to point to then that problem doesn't exist but it yeah it would need some way to keep track of that uh, lip fuse internal state effectively so it could be restored yeah i i mean i really think that probably the you know you, you want to look hard at nfs mm -hmm. and, and how it does state recovery particularly in v4 uh and i think with that you probably could get something that that approaches more seamless uh, a recovery and you wouldn't need to do this by mounting stuff right you know because your stuff you know the presumably the, the entries and inodes would just still be around yeah thanks a lot sorry what thanks a lot for the question and ah, okay oh, sorry from, yeah yeah we have anything else we still have about 10 minutes to go but we can have a break otherwise. So then they can I, yeah, maybe they have an interest. Yeah, in I, I, I can add, add some stuff then. Uh, it was said that uh, we, we we need to take a look on the network file systems and I, that, that was, I actually did before. And I have seen some kind of very similar machinery in CFS, I believe it's just Samba like thing. Uh, and they have the file revalidation after connection loss or something. And the idea is pretty, pretty similar. They calculate the, as a string, they, they recalculate the uh, full pass to the file and then issue the request that will effectively look up the same in new entry for the same pass and then replace it, like hotly replace it for the struct file and yeah, probably we can do something like that, but I have not, but yeah, Stefan mentioned we haven't uh, played with this one thing because it was not very critical for the LXCFS and we stopped on the bind bound stuff and yeah, but 
Yeah, definitely looking I closer also, on the end. Sorry? There's also, there has been some discussion, there's been some discussion on um, uh, allowing essentially PPF programs to be attached to Fuse and redirect like from one inode to the other and kind of stuff like that. And I wonder actually if you implemented uh, LexiFS in eBPF that this whole recovery thing would sort of be trivial. Or, or having BPF just be the black box. You could have BPF keep track of, of the inodes and what it is so that <laughs> if it recovers, then it has like a BPF map or something it can just use to remap the old stuff to the new stuff. Sure, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't really... Like, it doesn't really... Like, for, use more BPF. I mean, I mean for LexiFS, it really, doesn't ma it really doesn't matter, right? It, it doesn't matter insofar as you, you only run LexiFS on the host and you need to start it as a privileged process. It's not like you actually need to use BPF in containers or anything, right. so... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, BP, yeah, we, even with nested containers, we just pass it through. We just bind mount it yes. all the way through. We don't, we don't run other instances, so that's not... I don't have a problem with like, oh, yeah, BPF is a problem because we can't load it from unprivileged containers. So that's not an issue here. Um, and it would be interesting to see like, like running the Uhul thing in the BPF might be kind of tricky because of a lot of the weirdness we need to do in, in LexCFS. But maybe having it handle that inode tracking might be an option, maybe. Um, that would be, would be interesting. And the other thing I was thinking was like, you know, we could maybe like have a big MFD thing we use and just use that to keep track of that part of the state of the APU so that if, if the process goes away, we can just recover that part and it's not, we don't need to actually process it on disk or anything. Um, it's a bit annoying. Like at the same time, the, the good thing with LexiFS is that we've got very few files and very few things open at any one time. So if we're just looking at this particular use case, that's fine. For other more complex, Fewer spy systems, uh, that could be a bit more of a problem. But as we're perfectly talking about moving that solution from being a generic infrastructure in the kernel for all fewer things to like a per spy system thing, anyways, then that opens more doors. Namespace proc. I mean, more than it is now. <laughs> I'm, I'm really joking. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why LexiFS exists. We tried that before. Uh, <laughs> um, now it's also getting kind of interesting. Like, I don't know. We would put into thing about like LexiFS in general and what it does because we've we've now we're now getting into the that weird mix where like in some of the container managers it's a mix of LexiFS and also system core interception and also other things to try and plug all of those things at the same time. Um, Anyway, I think that gives us some ideas. All right, well, we're gonna have like a five minutes uh, break to switch to the other speakers. We're also gonna be um, online. And then we wrap up with an in-person um, in talk to, to wrap up the day. Thanks, Alex. <laughs>